It all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today, my guest is Ann Byler, founder of Auntie Ann's, the world's largest hand-rolled soft pretzel franchise. Ann began twisting pretzels back in 1987 and grew a single farmer's market stand into a successful 900 store franchise in less than 20 years. Her professional success, however, was forged after years of darkness, depression, and despair brought on by the accidental death of her 19-month-old daughter. Anne's personal story and entrepreneurial insights have been featured on many television shows, including Secret Millionaire, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Good Morning America. In 2005, Anne sold Auntie Anne's and authored the business memoir, Twist of Faith, and she has since written two other books, The Secret Lies Within and the recently released Overcome and Lead. Today, Anne speaks to audiences around the world, inspiring people with her authentic stories and life experiences. Her mission is to help women overcome the pain, blame, and shame of their past by sharing their stories. Ann Byler, welcome into the corner office. Thank you, Brad, for having me today. I'm so um, I'm happy and uh, honored uh, to be on your show. Well, we're not only honored and so happy to hear you, but as this is our 200th episode, it's a milestone in our podcast journey. And uh, when we spoke about a month or so ago, I was so, so honored to uh, know that you'd be interested in, in having this, having that you've had so many other folks like Oprah and others uh, getting a chance to chat with you. And, you know, I'd really just like to start where it all started for you. Tell us a little bit about your early family life. I knew you grew up as a Mennonite and obviously had have had a kind of wonderful career, but obviously with a lot of issues and tragedies that have come along the way. But let's let's begin where it all began for you. Tell us about that early family life and, and when you grew up. Yeah, well, thank you, um, Brent. So I started out as a little Amish girl. Mom and dad were horse and buggy Amish and uh, oh, wow. at the in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. It's, it's uh, where it all started for me. I'm one of uh, eight children. There are three, wow. three girls and five boys in our family. Mom and dad um, left the old order Amish and went to the black car Amish. So I grew up in the uh, Amish community, although my mom and dad had a black car and my dad was able to farm with a tractor. And that's why he left uh, the old order Amish. So that meant that we were moving on up. We had electricity and we also had a telephone. But uh, we (laughs) we looked very Amish and uh, as an outsider, you would never have known that we're not Amish, except that we were driving uh, around in a black car instead of a horse and buggy. So right. that's that's my culture, Brent. And uh, I, I I'm grateful today. The older I get, the more grateful I am for mom and dad who were mm. um, always there, always there. Yeah. Yeah. They were always somewhere on the farm. You know, we had about a hundred acre farm. Dad wow. um, milked or maybe 50 cows or whatever. So we all worked together on the farm. And uh, family life was, um, it was a lot of hard work, but we also learned how to play. And I think mm. my greatest, my most uh, uh, fondest memories were uh, that we sat around the table for 10 of us every breakfast, every lunch, mm. and every dinner without exception. Wow. That was the order of the day. And so I think the um, the discipline on the farm was rigorous. It's <laughs> looking back, it seemed like it, but you don't you don't know what you don't know. So that's all you do. Yeah. Is, growing that's up. what we did. Yeah. So I feel very I, I just I'm grateful for my heritage and what mom and dad uh, taught me in my younger years. 
where were you in the pecking order? Of, uh, I'm of number students? three, and number three. <laughs> I was the I was always concerned about peace in the family. I, I have no idea where that came from, um, <laughs> except that you were the peacemaker at the table. I, were you? <laughs> I don't know if I was a verbal peacemaker, I but I really, really wanted peace in the family at any cost. So I do think there were times I jumped in and actually tried to be the peacemaker. I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was important. And, and the family's uh, spiritual religious practices were, were, were they as um, uh, forthright and structured as your mealtime and, you know, the farming and everything else. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my whole life was very structured. And it's, so it was uh, to church every Sunday morning wow. and every Sunday night we went to church and there was never any whining or complaining about uh, whether or not I want to go to church. It was never a question, Brent. Right, right. Never an option, right? Never an option. So, you know, mom and dad taught us, uh, you know, I heard uh, from my therapist many years ago that the greatest form of of teaching is, in fact, role modeling. You know, my mom and dad didn't sit down and teach us a whole lot of things like, uh, you know, but we learned it in school. We learned it. Uh, my mom and dad role modeled what they what was important to us. And we learned it in in church. And they all said the same thing. My church, my school, my parents, everybody said the same thing. Basically was uh, love God, keep his commandment and love each other. Mm -hmm. And that's how I grew up. And Brent, there was nothing that I wanted to do any more in life than to please God and to please my parents. I wanted mom and dad to be proud of me. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up being a a pretty good girl. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Dad never, I never got a spanking. I mean, <laughs> I, I wanted, I was a pleaser. And so do I regret that? Or do I feel like I was pretending or like it was some sort of, uh, no, uh, sincerely, I wanted to please God and my parents. And I knew if I did that, then God would um, be pleased with me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I love that. And, and uh, mom, of course, worked the home. Dad was a farmer. Um, Did that change at any point while you're still at home or did they continue on in that tradition as you grew up through the years? No, we stayed. uh, That was the tradition. And that's what I, you know, I married um, a young Amish man as a Amish guy as well. He was a tall, tall, dark and handsome kind of a dude. uh, (laughs) He grew up in the Amish culture and the two of us together, we knew what our roles were because our parents both uh, you know, role modeled that for us. So that was a right. question, but that changed for me and my husband, but for not for my parents. So your education, tell us a little bit about that, because as I understand it, it didn't last that long. I was going to say, not it won't take me long to tell you about my education. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so growing up in the Amish culture, you go through the eighth grade, which is until you're uh, 15 and right. then you quit school. And and the, and the greatest accomplishment of all is when you are finally able to work on the farm, help mom and dad make a living. And um, I remember the day I was so proud that I could, uh, you know, I went through, um, I went halfway through eighth grade because I turned 15 and then I was able to quit school. And I was so excited because mm. I could help mom and dad on the farm. And that, yeah. that was just the norm. I, I believe that education is incredibly important. And uh, although I did not have that privilege and always tell people I'm not a high school dropout, I never went to high school. So right. yeah. <laughs> no, you, you completed all the education was expected of you. Well, right. you learned the three R's, right. you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, right. and um, right. it served me well. And, you know, I have to tell you though, when I turned, uh, after we started Auntie Anne's and I'm in a, in a whole different world now, it's a corporate, lots of, uh, there was a, a lot of, uh, uh, very educated people and people that knew a whole lot more than I did. And uh, there was a time when I even heard uh, employees like in our Auntie Anne stores, I would hear them say, well, you know, Auntie Anne didn't go to high school. And so maybe I don't need to. And what I believe that as a leader is to, it really is important to role model. And right. so I went and got my GED when I turned uh, 50. And I realized then I got all A's and I was so excited and I, I walked, uh, wore a cap and gown and I walked, I did everything like I, I was, it was an amazing honor for me. But before I received my um, GED, 
I received my very first uh, honorary doctor degree. So, you know, God oh, really backwards for me. So <laughs> that's great. That's terrific. So, so let's go back. So 15 years old, you, you've, you've accomplished the goals that mom and dad and the, and the community laid out for you. You, you got your, uh, your, your, your equivalent, your eighth, eighth grade degree. And you went to work on the farm. How much longer after that did you start your own family? Did you, you said you met your, your husband at that time. Was, was he someone that, uh, was in that local community, and when did you get married? Tell us a little bit about that period. So, as I mentioned, he grew up Amish as well, and we at that time, our uh, um, our teenage years were all about you know being involved in the church, going to parties, birthday yeah. parties, youth meetings, whatever. And so, his brother was having a birthday party, and he invited me to uh, to his party, and that's where I met Jonas um, for the first time. I was sixteen, and he was wow. nineteen. No, I'm sorry, 18. And that night he asked me out for a date. And um, when I met him, I was completely, um, I, I can't say I was in love with him, but my heart beat. Uh, every yeah, time I close to excited. Him. <laughs> excited <laughs> word, yeah, good word. And uh, so we dated three and a half years. And by the time I was 19 and a half, I got, when I got married and he was 21 and um, we both knew what we wanted. We wanted to, there was a couple of things we wanted to serve God, serve our community and have a family. And that was my dream. Fantastic. And so that began in that same community. Is that where the two of you started your family? Yes, we stayed in the Amish community. By then, uh, when Jonas and I got married, we were actually had gone from the Amish, uh, the black car Amish to the uh, very conservative Mennonite church. But okay. We're still in the same community, Lancaster County, very close to our parents and our relatives and very much in the Amish culture. Right. Tell us a little bit about those differences between the Amish and the Mennonites. I, I don't know personally that I've I've read a little bit about it, but is there is there is a, a pretty big difference between how those two cultures live? Well, you know, the belief system is very it's very much the same. They believe in in Christ as Jesus as the Savior of the world, and the the very uh, a biblical foundation is very much the same. Uh, Amish Amish Mennonite and Mennonite very much the same. The Mennonite. Uh, within within all of those, they have um, uh, the Amish. There are the more progressive Amish, um, and then in the Amish, Mennonite, the Black Car Amish, there are more, the more progressive uh, Black Car Amish, okay. and in the Mennonites, there's also uh, the, the more progressive and the very conservative. So I was always on the very very conservative side until about three years into our marriage, my husband and I became very uh, interested and very, um, I had accepted Christ when I was 12 and I, um, I, I knew that I was saved and, uh, was, had the promise of eternal life. But when I turned 21, I became very, very interested. I, I, I got this, um, desire and hunger to read the word of God. And I, I, I just couldn't get enough of God's word. And it was during that time that my husband and I both together uh, began our, our, our spiritual journey that was unlike anything that we had experienced before. As a result, uh, he and I and uh, three other couples, we wanted to build a church in the, right in the middle of Lancaster County because we no longer wanted the the old order, the traditional Black Car Amish, the uh, conservative Mennonite worship, we wanted something that was more free. And we ended up building a, a charismatic church right in the middle of oh. <laughs> of Lancaster County. It, it's wild. It's wild. There's a whole story about that, but uh, very, very exciting times for us. The inspiration around building an evangelical church, where, where did that come from? Was it just your both of your studies of, you know, the scripture and that what kind of God spoke to you as a Holy Spirit inspired? What do you kind of put at the foundation of that? Absolutely. Um, I would yeah. say the um, the foundation does go to back to a lady by the name of Jotan. Um, she came from Jakarta, Indonesia. God called wow. her to Lancaster County. Um, to have Bible studies for the Mennonite people. And that's where it started. And uh, I started going to her Bible studies, and yeah. it was unlike anything that I had ever uh, experienced, anything that I had ever been taught. And um, it really put us on a journey of, uh, I, I want to say, spiritual spiritual freedom that we had never known existed. Fantastic. And had you started your family by that time? Uh, at that time, we had no children, but we uh, right. within three years, uh, we uh, the very uh, within about a year, we had our first miscarriage, 
And then about two and a half years later, we had our first baby. Her name was Luana. And he Mm. and I, uh, we wanted uh, four girls. I'm not sure why we settled on four girls, but we both wanted four four daughters. And uh, two years later, we had another little girl. Her name was Angela Joy. And uh, we were... We were living our dream, Brent. We were doing yeah. exactly what we wanted to do, and we knew that God was so much a part of our life. And it was during that time that I honestly, I would tell Jonas every now and again, I think I, I need to pinch myself. I just felt like <laughs> it, it was so good. It's almost too good to be true. But it was really, we were living living the dream, our dream, and uh, loving each other. We had a great relationship, and um. I, I, my theology at that time, Brent, was because life was always so good. I had never experienced any uh, ter- terrible tragedies in our family, even though there was eight kids. We, nothing really bad happened on our family in a few little accidents. But I, I truly believe that uh, life is good and God is harsh. And that um, as long as I please God, keep all the Ten Commandments, uh, be a good wife, be a good mother, you know, God would be pleased and bless me. Yeah. And uh, what I know today, Brant, is that uh, after seven years of uh, life's experiences, I know now that life is hard, mm. but God is good. And I am not confused about that at all. When bad <laughs> things happen, I know that God is good. Well, let's talk about a couple of those. I know you lost a dear daughter. And was that number one? Number two? Which of that... Uh, that was number two. Angela was 19 months old in 12, 12 yeah. days. And um, again, uh, loving, loving life, uh, very involved in our um, charismatic church at that time and yeah. um, took the girls to church. We went to church all the time. That was our life. It was our, um, our, our calling. And Jonas and I were youth pastors to a couple of hundred young Ooh. people. And, um, but that all changed uh, September the 8th. 1975. Ooh. Now that's could be before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I graduated from college in 76. So I, or, yeah, high school rather. So I've been around a while. <laughs> um, I know that to many people it would sound like a very long time ago, but you know, uh, tragedy, when tragedy strikes tra- mm. and is traumatic, uh, like as I'm telling you right now, I, I my mind remembers every every detail of that day. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, the, the part, all of that, the, the part about all of that is that I didn't know anything about a tragedy. I didn't know anything about trauma. Mm. Um, our, our sweet Angie was uh, walking up to my mom's house, which she always said, we lived in the, in the country and we lived on a farmette. We lived in a double wide trailer and my parents lived uh, next to us and there was a barn and then it was their house. And so oh, very close. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Angie would walk up to my mom's house uh, mm. almost every morning for her uh, uh, her second breakfast. And I would always call my mom and tell her that she was on her way. And again, it was a very safe uh, place and we never worried about our children being out and about. And yeah. Um, between, but my my sister was working for my dad. They had a he had a stone mason uh, a business, and my sister drove a tractor. It's called a bobcat. And um, that particular morning, she always looked to see if the, any of the kids were around, and um, she looked and didn't see anybody. And so when she looked forward, uh, she was scooping up. Uh, she went to scoop up the sand, and his body uh, was in front of the bobcat. And um, she had driven over ax over her accidentally, and Angie was mm. killed um, instantly that morning. Oh, goodness gracious! And of so course, um, uh, living the dream um, stopped in that moment. Yeah. And um, uh, my dad came uh, uh, running across the yard. I didn't I didn't see it happen, but um, my dad did, and he came running across the yard with. Uh, Angie's lifeless body in his hands mm-hmm. and wailing and just saying, I think she's dead. I think she's dead. Um, you know, trauma and um, it puts you in shock. And I remember every detail. Um, but, but I think what um, looking hindsight is 2020. Uh, I had no idea that at that moment, how my life would change. Yeah. Yeah. And um, because I thought I was a good girl and because I thought, that God must be very pleased with me. And 
because I tried to do all the right things, I instantly I went into a um I, I questioned why did God let this happen to me? I was so confused. And that's why I that's why I can say I know today that. Life is hard and God is good. And that's what I've, that's what I have discovered through my pain. And that yeah. day, as Angie made her ascent into heaven, I began my slow and very gradual descent into a world of spiritual confusion and mm. emotional pain, which I knew nothing about up until that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How would you find your way? <laughs> well... Uh, I want to say tears and prayers. Yeah. And um, because I didn't have the vocabulary to talk about my grief, I didn't have the vocabulary to talk about my my confusion about why God. So I went into Goodness. isolation, mm. and uh, I didn't talk about it. Yeah. I couldn't. And my sister and I, we never were estranged. I never blamed her. Um, I just felt equally sad for her. Yeah, of course. And yeah. um, so our whole world changed. And Jonas yeah. and I were best friends, but in time we couldn't talk. And uh, my youngest daughter, who was uh, my other daughter, who was four at that time, was very sad. Yeah. She didn't have her sister to to play with anymore. So everything changed for me, but I, I, I kept the way I got through it, Brent was I kept doing what I always did. I never stopped. Yeah. And so I did that for, I, I kept going to church. I kept, um, yeah. I pretended that I was okay. And I really got good at that because I didn't want my sister to know. I didn't want her to know how bad I was feeling. Yeah. And I didn't want my other daughter to know how bad I was feeling. And somehow I knew that Jonas would always be there and that maybe he understood. I I don't know. I don't know, but I was in a complete silence for when I say silence. I mean, I didn't talk about it, but I but I kept being Ann Byler, who I'd always been by doing all the things I'd always done. And uh, five months later, I. I was at the end of myself and again, um, not being able to, I, I cried in, in, in secret and smiled in public. Mm. And, um, one night I, I just, um, just told God that I, I can't do this anymore. I, I need, to, I have to find somebody to talk to. Yeah. And my pastor came to me at church and said, uh, come see me. Uh, I want to, I, I, I know that you're not, doing okay uh, come see me tomorrow in my office and i was like uh, oh wow somebody noticed i was almost felt i felt bad that somebody actually <laughs> noticed that i was sad on the other hand i was thrilled that somebody wanted to talk to me sure. and so i went to see my pastor the next morning and um i was relieved that i could actually talk about this if somebody would ask me the right you know if somebody asked me the right things and right. um it was so relieving to me and I was beginning to feel like um, hopeful. And uh, before I left his office, he took advantage of me physically <clears throat> and it put me into, and also told me never to tell anyone. <clears throat> and when I left his office, I knew then that I would never tell because nobody would believe me. And plus, I don't know how to, how would I tell what, what do I say? <clears throat> So that one secret that I kept um, put me into 20, almost 25 years of mild to severe depression, which was a very, very dark place to be. Tough. Almost like a two, two, two punch, right? Two, two hit punch from one or the other. Well, Annie's, Annie Ann's pretzels came along about uh, the next decade, right? Now tell us a little bit the origin story there. How did that come about? Was that kind of part of your therapy did you did you find that you know you're cooking and obviously you know the wonderful work that you've done over the years in building that business help you through all this okay so there were seven years of of quiet of silence where i didn't say anyone to anything to anyone and i was in this abusive relationship for almost seven years mm. at the end of that time 
I was a skin and bones, literally, I weighed maybe 90 pounds. I hated mm. who I'd become. I knew for sure that I was unlovable, I was unforgivable, and I knew that I was unchangeable, that nothing would ever change. And uh, that that's very typical for any uh, child or woman or young girl that's in an abusive uh, relationship with a perpetrator. It's uh, it's very hopeless and very dark, and and there's really no way out. And so during that time, I I believed that if I told my husband that if he knew what was happening going on in my life, that he would divorce me. So I never I didn't mm-hmm. want to tell. At the end of those nearly seven years, I finally one day it's like God just said, "Get up off your knees, um, stop crying." And go tell your husband mm-hmm. what's, what's going on. I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to get through this. And I wanted to be a wife and a mother, and I wanted to be married. But I, I didn't. I didn't know that I was able. I didn't think I'd be able to do that. But so there was something inside of me, and I want to say, Holy Spirit inside of me gave me the mm-hmm. strength uh, and the courage to go tell my husband what was happening. And I, I can't. I don't have the time to tell you what the outcome of that was but it was unbelievable miraculous supernatural Mm -hmm. in every way the way he responded to me and i want to say all that to say that it was during that time when he learned about what was happening in my life he he was completely devastated but he never blamed me Mm -hmm. instead he took the route of like how can this happen to us yeah we 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 love God. We loved each other. We had grieved over our daughter. How can this happen? And what that did is it took him into the world of psychology. Mm-hmm. And he began to try to understand. Um, and he went to emergent ministries in Akron, Ohio. And in, in those days, it was a correspondence courses they did. And he did a correspondence course for many years. He studied with uh, Emerge Ministries, and he got his layman's uh, license for counseling, layman's counseling license, so that he was able to counsel in the church in our neighborhood. And he got so passionate about doing this. He told me, "This is my dream. This is what I want to do the rest of my mm-hmm. life, and uh, I want to do it as a free service." And I said, "Well, okay, if you want to do it as a free service, I love you. I honor you. You're my hero. I better get a job. <laughs> I'd have to get back to work." <laughs> you know, we agreed that, okay, that's what we'll do. So I went to a yeah. farmer's market, learned how to make pretzels. And um, it's an amazing story. And if any of our listeners want to hear the details of this crazy, amazing God story, they can pick up my book, Overcome and Lead, uh, from uh, off of my website or uh, Amazon, Amazon. And we'll and we'll have a link. To, there's a link to it as well, where the episode is being uh, being displayed, so everyone can go and grab that. Yeah. And it was your second book, right? Your, your other book, Twist of Faith, as well, which I've read. I have Twist of Faith: The Secret Lies Within, which is about overcoming my trauma, and then the the latest yeah. one I just launched is Overcome and Lead. Yeah. Um, so it was it was our out of our pain, our purpose was born, and my husband just became. Uh, um, he was called, I'm going to say obsessed. He was so passionate about helping other couples. And I went to work and I was so proud that I could go to work mm-hmm. and make enough money to so that he could do this. And for 10 yeah. years, um, we started Antians at that time. And for 10 years, um, he was able to do free counseling. And we had at some point, we had uh, anywhere from 10 to 50 people on staff. Um, we ended up uh, started with just in a very small office, but we grew as Antigens wow. grew, his counseling center grew. Well, let's just pause a second, Ann. Isn't this absolutely wonderful? Because your biggest fear would be that he would leave and divorce you. And this event brought you closer together. What a miracle. It's miraculous. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've always <sighs> said that just like a secret has far reaching impacts, negative impacts. Yeah. When when I when I made that confession to Jonas that day, yeah. Yeah. a confession has far reaching positive impacts. Yes. Yes. And the day I confessed to him was the day mm. that God began to redeem us, me, yeah. uh, my marriage, my family. Mm. And out of that, Antias was a part of that redemption. It's just uh, a crazy, amazing story. I just I have to cry fantastic. every time I tell the story, Brent. I'm sorry. It's so amazing to me still. Because I what a miracle! I love it. Dark world, it's <laughs> such a dark world, and going from that into this amazing, this big world filled with light and challenges and opportunities and working and doing things for God's kingdom, 
more than I could ever have dreamed, more than I could ever have dreamed for. And we went from one store to two stores the first year. The next year we did uh, 12 stores, the next year 35. And the three wow. things we did not have when we started at Dan's was formal education, a business plan. We had no capital. Yeah. But what we had was far more <laughs> is all we needed. We yeah. had a great purpose. Yeah. We had a great product. Yeah. And we had great people. And mm. that's what it took. The three to build. P's. The three <laughs> I P's, love it. The three small P's equal the capital P, which is profit, which is what you must have <laughs> to stay in business. Right. But if you right. pay attention to what you have, eventually uh, you will be profitable. So, Anne, how did you do it? You know, eighth grade education, you know, believer in God, following his word Two, you know, unbearable tragedies. You know, your husband supports you. He goes into counseling. Doesn't sound like he was involved in the business, but I'm sure he provided his perspective, but he wasn't a business person. How did you find the right people? How did you go about building out that business from that first store and, and onward from 87? I mean, this answer may be a little too simple. But I I loved people. <clears throat> I always, in my heart, I always wanted to, in my little, my simple way, I wanted to help people yeah. have a better life. <clears throat> and through Auntie Anne's, I began to see the opportunity that I had to take a high school kid and bring them into my store. <clears throat> uh, teach them uh, how to do business in, in a very small, just in very, the basics, I would say, like uh, customer service, yeah. <laughs> uh, do yeah. a job well, uh, be, be teachable, um, um, work as a team. All of these things that I know are big, you can overcomplicate all of that. And people can, people write books about all of that and understand <laughs> that. But in my simple Amish upbringing, I, I simply wanted people to become more than what they thought they yeah. were. Yeah. And so I'd bring them in and initially into our one store, then in two stores. And then, then we helped other people build 12 more stores. Jonas and I, we, the two of us together built 12 more stores. We brought people in so they could own their own company. Mm. And, and as time went on, um, we, we began to see the potential that, our purpose was really bigger than d developing people became my my passion. Yeah. And how did I know who to hire? I, I want to tell you initially <laughs> what we did. I'll never forget it. Jonas and I were in it over our heads. We were so busy. And one day we realized that we needed to hire a, a manager so that we could we call it a manager, but we weren't exactly sure what the role was, but we knew that right. we needed somebody over us uh, to manage uh, the, the 12, 14 sure. stores that we had. Yeah. Yeah. We got on our knees beside our bed and we just, mm. we had a list of things that we needed done. And we got on our knees before our, beside our bed and we just got before God and we just said, <laughs> Lord, uh, this here, we lifted the paper up to him and said, this is what we need. We don't know who that person is. Mm. but we know that you know. Yeah. And honestly, Brent, it's unbelievable how God brought us the people that we needed. I would say for the first two years, uh, three years probably, people came to us with expertise that we needed, and that's how we hired for the first three years. Wow. Right, right, right people at the right time. Yes, mm. absolutely. Yeah. Well, you ran that business for almost 20 years before it was sold. How many stores and how big was the business when you sold it back in 2005? We had about 900 stores. Wow. Um, by 2005, we started wow. 1988. And by two, 1995, we were um, built our did our first international store in Jakarta, Indonesia. Wow. And by 2005... We had about nine. I want to say eight seventy-five, eight ninety. I, I yeah. honestly don't remember the number. Um, yeah, uh, but it was such a wild ride, such an enjoyable. I mean, wild, enjoyable, uh, difficult. <laughs> um, you know, 
we knew nothing, zero about corporate America. Right. By the end of 18 years, um, I mean, I'm I'm happy to say that I became a businesswoman and I and I began to understand what my role was. My role was mm. not to be a manager. My role was to be a leader. Yeah. And when I began, when I understood that, I realized that toward the end of the uh, my tenure as Auntie Anne at the, at the company, I realized that God gave us a, a pretzel first, and then He gave us a platform to share our story for God's yeah. glory. It's yeah. incredible the way God unfolded His plan in our lives, and I'm still completely amazed by it. It's really hard for me to tell that story. You're still pinching yourself I, I'm from still time pinching. to time. I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and and some of the the, the difficulties, the obstacles, and I've, I've often said if if you know what your purpose is, the three things that yeah. we had I mentioned a minute ago. Number one, I knew what our purpose was from day one. Yeah. And number two. We knew we had a great product, and we also knew we had great people. But but when you know what your purpose is, your purpose will give you the power to overcome any obstacle that you mm. face. It yeah. will give you a passion for your people, and it will give you a position of influence if you understand what your purpose is. And that's what we lived out for 18 years. Yeah, fantastic. So it's been almost as many years since you sold the business, right? Or about 17, 18 years after that. How have you been spending your time? How have you been, you know, really using, you know, the direction that God gave you in this next chapter of your life? Initially, Brent, we took the proceeds of the sale of Antiens and we bought a farm, a 125 acre farm. <laughs> and we built a, a um, we developed that farm, but our very first building on that farm was to build a uh, counseling, we called it a gap community center. It was a mm. 55,000 square foot building. <laughs> and in that building, there were many, many services for the community counseling. We had a cafe. We had just many services. We had uh, care practitioners, a medical doctor, uh, daycares. So, so for about, so we took the funds and built that. And then for about eight years, um, we were involved in doing that. And during that time, my husband was more involved in that than I was. But right, right. That was his training. That yeah. was his, exactly. Yeah, and yeah, during yeah. that time, I realized uh, that that um, I felt the the call to share my story. And that's when yeah. I wrote The the Twist of Faith, Twist of which faith. was published, I believe, in 2009. Oh, so you wrote that after with the sale. Okay, after the sale, and yes, I wasn't correct. Sure I was. And that's yeah. when I began to speak. And um, I, I realized that I... I enjoy speaking, and so that became my passion. And today, it's really been narrowed down to two tracks that I'm on. I love to speak in corporate settings and talk about the power of purpose. And then I, my, I want to say my greater passion, my deeper passion is um, meeting women where they are and speaking at uh, yeah. women's conferences and uh, yeah. talking to them about. Uh, the power of their story, that they have a story, and to talk to them about overcoming um, the book that I wrote, uh, uh, The Secret Lies Within It, encouraging women uh, and uh, teaching them about the power of confession, uh, going mm. from darkness, the the secrets that you keep, um, helping women, uh, anyone that will listen to me, actually, <laughs> mm, yeah. um, be vulnerable, open, vulnerable, and transparent with your life. And uh I call it uh, a new view of confession. And I believe that as people, uh, men or women, if we learn um, to um, communicate, as we learn to uh, communicate and confess, uh, confession is really, truly the highest form of communication because it's when yeah. we're real that we actually connect with one another. And I know we need this in the workplaces. We need yep. this in our churches. We need this in our homes. We need it in our relationships. And that's what I teach. Yeah. I yeah. Really that authenticity that. is so important. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 
we have so many women listeners and and I know we're going to have, you know, huge uh, engagement with this uh, particular one because of, of course, your fame, but also just, you know, your, your story, the, the authenticity of it and, and the challenges that you've overcome. And, you know, I know you've kind of touched on a lot of this as we've gone through the podcast and we're getting close to our ending time here, but if you could just kind of sum up, what would you have to say to, you know, the women out there in particular that perhaps have had some of the challenges challenges that you've had. Maybe they've been violations of their trust by others. Maybe there's been the loss that they've experienced, but you know, they're, they're still motivated. They want to succeed. They want to, you know, move on. What, what, what's the kind of counsel that you would give them to, you know, encourage them to get over those things and, and proceed in their career or whatever their passion may take them? As business women, as mothers, as moms, or whatever, people in general, I think as leaders, we we want to accomplish. We want to be effective. Yeah. And uh, I want to just encourage anyone who's listening that there's more. Now, that sounds so simple. We're, we're always looking to climb the ladder, you know, but the truth is there's more inside of you. And if you can learn to develop the more inside of you, mm. uh, you will become more effective. If you have experienced trauma and some of the things that I've talked about, and I so I know that there are women out there that have experienced much more than what I have. So um, I want to say to you, don't stop where you are and don't give up. Um, get up every morning, put one foot in front of the other, do what you have to do. But the most important thing, if you want to get through this and, and get your trauma and your abuse and your you want your voice back again, uh, my encouragement to you is pick up the phone right now. Don't don't wait, but pick up the phone right now and call someone <clears throat> that you trust <clears throat> and be real, authentic, be vulnerable and tell someone about what is going on in your life. And don't <clears throat> keep it a secret any longer. <clears throat> and many people respond. Many times people will respond to me and they say, I don't there's nobody I can talk to. My response, that is, that's not true. That is, in fact, a lie. There is someone that you can talk to other than God. You can pray and talk to Jesus and talk to God. That's that's a privilege that we have. But if you want to overcome and you want to overcome your secrets and your silence and you and and you uh, want to move on, you, you're going to have to talk to somebody about what's happening in your life. So I encourage you, uh, call, pick up the phone. Go have coffee with someone, <clears throat> pour out your heart, be authentic. And when you begin, that's only that's only the beginning of a transformation that will take place in your life as you yeah. unload your secrets um, yeah. to someone that will listen to you. But don't put it off. Wonderful wisdom. Wonderful wisdom. Ann Byler, founder of Auntie Anne's, speaker, author. Uh, we'll have links to all the books that you've written here. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your journey into the corner office. Thank you, Brad, for having me. What an honor. God bless you. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.